this for our opening prayer this morning. O Lord, our good shepherd, you are the source of all true and lasting joy. We praise you for your power, which is beyond compare. We worship you for your wisdom, which is beyond understanding. You can meet all our needs. You restore the brokenhearted and heal the wounded. You have revealed yourself to your people and are building your church against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. How great you are, Lord. Fill our hearts with love as we respond by singing praises to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
epistle lesson today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. That's Romans, chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. Hear the word. Blessed are those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with anyone. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good morning, St. Mark. My name is Jalen Pirtle, and today I will be reading your scripture. Today our text comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 30. And it reads, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to, as he began a settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children all had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell to his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But as the servant went out, he found that one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, he grabbed the, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could repay the debt. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
St. Mark and family. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord yet again. God has been so good to us. He's allowed us to see and experience another wonderful, wonderful day. So we praise the Lord this morning for his goodness and mercy in our lives. Please be in an attitude of prayer with me. Precious God, as always, we first glorify you for being the wonderful God that you are. A God who continues to sustain the universe. A God who continues to redeem us from our sins. Indeed, the God who created all that is. So we thank you, God, for giving us this opportunity to again come into your presence. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be with each of us wherever we are. And that that spirit would free us to glorify you with the praise you deserve. In the name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, now, this morning we are in our ninth week in a row talking about everything that love is and everything that love ain't, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Last week we noted that love is not easily angered, but can and should be angered over that which is wrong. Well, we might say that Today's love ain't word is a sequel to last week's sermon about anger. Love thinks no evil. Love keeps no record of being wrong. Love doesn't keep score on the sins of others. Love takes no account of evil done to it. Or put simply, love does not hold a grudge. Love doesn't hold a grudge. You know what a grudge is, don't you? A grudge is that persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from something done to insult or to harm you. They made you mad, and the anger stayed with you long past the event that angered you. You've, you've had a grudge before, haven't you? There may even be a few of you out there harboring a grudge or few right now that go back months, years, and sometimes even decades. Regardless of what caused your anger, the effect of holding a grudge is that more often than not, it harms you more than it harms the one with whom you're holding the grudge. I can't tell you how many times someone informed me of their anger about something that I did or didn't do Yet while they were sitting there angry, I wasn't sweating it at all because I had absolutely no idea that they were even unhappy. There's a story I heard about a letter written from one neighbor to another that read, Dear Frank, we've been neighbors for six tumultuous years. When you borrowed my lawnmower, you returned it in pieces, but I didn't say anything. When I was sick, you blasted your music, but I didn't say anything. And when your dog went to the bathroom all over my lawn, you laughed, but I didn't say anything at all. I could go on and on, but I'm certainly not one to hold grudges. And though I know you're at work right now, I figured the least I could do was write you this letter to let you know that your house is on fire. Cordially, Bob. <laughs> if, if you don't let them know that they are on your last nerve, they will stay on your last nerve. A grudge can take place for any reason and fester in the mind of the agreed for years until it finally blows up, while the person who made you angry had no idea you were mad at all. Now, now here's the strange thing about grudges. As with any kind of anger, the natural tendency is to react aggressively 
in order to stop what is angering you. But emotional pain and anger caused by rejection or disrespect, they can quickly be masked by the pleasure of being presented with an opportunity to get revenge. In other words, some folks hold on to grudges for the pleasure of contemplating how to get some payback. They made you mad. But the thought of getting revenge was something you love to contemplate in your mind. So, so you were finding pleasure even in the midst of your pain. A grudge can be sweet and it can be sour. Yet like any form of anger, it will eat away at your mental health. It can compromise your physical health. Indeed, it can even shorten your lifespan. And worst case scenarios, it can keep you in a state of mental sin as you consider how much you hate the other party. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, encouraging them to put their grudges to rest. He understood anger could not only harm the one who held the grudge, anger would not only harm the one whom the grudge was held against, but a grudge could put the entire faith community at risk as the outside world observed Christians acting a fool by trying to get revenge on one another. There ain't no mess like a church mess. Can I get an amen, somebody? Romans 12, beginning with verse 17 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If she is thirsty, Give us something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but be overcome evil with good. Now, I know some of you right now are seething mad because you've been just waiting, holding on for just the right moment to get that no good so-and-so for doing what they did to you. But now you're hearing the word of God saying, chill out, hold on, step away, because vengeance is God's. How do you put away your grudge while waiting on the Lord to take care of it? Shoot, God might end up waiting until judgment day, or worse yet, God might even forgive that other party altogether. A study from the Journal of Psychology and Health found that one third of Americans do not sleep well on several nights per week. They also noted in the study that for many of those persons, meditation and medication were not the cure. Rather, these insomniacs got better sleep once they were able to forgive themselves and or to forgive others. That is, lingering anger and lingering guilt are primary contributors to sleepless nights because people who don't forgive tend to linger on unpleasant thoughts and feelings of anger, blame, and regret. Those repetitive thoughts create stress and distress that even counting sheep cannot heal. If you want to sleep better, if you want to get a better night's rest, if you want to have better health, and if you want to be happier, forgiveness can be a key ingredient. Jesus completely understood this. He understood it when he shared the parable about the kingdom of God in Matthew 18. You see, in verse 15 of that chapter, he had just taught the disciples that when a sister or brother in the Lord does you wrong, 
you first bring it to their attention. And if they hear you, meaning that if they apologize or make things right, you have gained or regained a brother. We'll return to that point in just a minute. So Peter comes back and says to Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing here, okay, Jesus, so I forgive them. How many times should I forgive a brother or sister who keeps on doing me wrong? Is seven times in a lifetime enough? Well, I don't know about you, but I think Peter had a point. I mean, if someone steals your raisin bran, then they say they're sorry for stealing your raisin bran. Hopefully you'll forgive them. But what if they come right back and steal your new box of raisin bran with the cranberries mixed in? Y'all tasted those, haven't you? What if they do that and you forgive them? And then they come back and steal your raisin brands again and again. Just how many times do you forgive them before they come to believe you're just weak and that they can continue stealing from you at will? Well, again, listen to the parable. Jesus gave this parable in response to Peter's question about how often to forgive. It's about a king who was collecting money that was owed to him by his own constituents. When he asked Tommy, one of those constituents, to pay him back the 10,000 bags of gold he was owed, that's a lot of gold right there, Tommy said, well, king, I just don't have that on me right now. So the king ordered that he, his wife, and his children be sold into slavery to cover the debt. Tommy then, as you can imagine, begged the king for more time to raise the money. So the king had mercy on him by extending the deadline by which he had to pay back the debt. Tommy then approached one of his own subordinates who owed him money and told him to pay up immediately because I got to pay back the king. When the man told Tommy he couldn't come up with the cash owed to him, Tommy had no mercy whatsoever, but immediately put the debtor behind bars. Ain't that about nothing? When the king heard that Tommy didn't have mercy on the one who owed him money, even though he had mercy on Tommy, the king rescinded his forgiveness and put Thomas in prison to be tortured. Jesus shared this parable as an illustration of how God will treat those who don't forgive their own sister and brother. He said it's not enough to forgive seven times. Rather, you should be willing to forgive a person 70 multiplied by seven times, meaning you should forgive them as often as they apologize. I mean, that's a whole lot of forgiveness, isn't it? But there are at least a couple of caveats that can help us out here. First, let's return to the point I asked you to hold on to a few minutes ago. Jesus said that the first step one should take when they find themselves singing a somebody done done somebody wrong song is to go to the person who did the wrong and state your case to them so that they will have an opportunity to respond to your complaint by repenting, by apologizing, or by denying they even did wrong. If the accused makes things right with you, then you should forgive them. If, however, they refuse to listen, Jesus says, take your complaint before two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to hear you, then state your case before the entire church. And if they still refuse to do you right, treat them as something other than a brother or sister in the faith by putting distance between you and they. The first point to understand here is this necessity to give the other party a chance to repent. The second point to realize is Jesus was talking in-house business about how believers were supposed to treat 
one another. Though his three-step process seems like a logical way to deal with in-house church stuff, times have indeed changed somewhat so that in most congregations, there are other means of dealing with steps two and three. In our church, for example, St. Mark, United Methodist Church of Chicago, we have a staff parish relations committee that ideally can help address in-house conflicts. Say amen, SPRC folk. Y'all been through that before, haven't you? But step one, which says to approach the other party and express your grievance, can still be a very appropriate step, whether it's in-house conflict that you're experiencing or something outside of the church. Before you hold a grudge on someone, at least inform them that you think they did you wrong. If they repent and apologize, forgive them because sincere repentance means they are probably not going to do you wrong like that again. If they continue harming you, however, that's a sign, at least in my mind, that their repentance was not sincere, meaning you are no longer obligated to treat them as a brother or sister that is someone not to be trusted, shake off the dust from your shoes, wipe off the dandruff from your shoulders, and move on with your life. If their repentance is not sincere, or if they refuse to repent at all, you should still want to forgive them if for no other reason than to get the anger out of your system. But you should not give them additional opportunities to cause you harm. I suppose at this point, it's appropriate to bring up the latest headlines in the news because some might argue that pure agape love would require you and I to give immediate forgiveness to the officer who shot Jacob Blake and to Rittenhouse for his shooting of the innocent protesters. Similarly, no grudge should be held, they would argue. But as we said last week, love is not easily angered. It's not easily made mad. And in the case of injustice, should be angered enough to take action. If you really love something and you really love someone, there are things you should get angry about. So if a person or institution continues to cause you harm because they did not sincerely repent, your love of God, your love of self, and your love of others require you to not forget what was happening in order to prevent it from happening again to you or to others. So, so, so you have the right to forgive the folks who shot Blake and the protesters, but you also have the right to hold a little grudge against them when they do not repent and change their ways. If there's anything good about a grudge, it is that remembrance of a harm may prevent you from being harmed again. But again, like any anger, a grudge should not be used to lead towards an event of revenge, but as an action of love that prevents more harm from occurring, right? You got a right to be mad, but you don't have the right to get revenge. Rather, you need to take actions that bring love into life. If the climate then in this particular climate we're in, we've got to be concerned about our responses to what's going on in the world around us. Like any anger, grudge should not lead to revenge, but to action that in love prevents more harm from occurring. In today's climate, grudges should lead to peaceful protests and legislation that 
reform unrepentant people in institutions that continue to kill us. I mean, therein lies the complexity of grudge. Love says forgive, but it does not ask you to take abuse for anything other than maybe sharing the gospel. In Desmond Tutu's book, the book No Future Without Forgiveness, he shares the story of a South African mother and daughter whose husband and father had been tortured and killed by the state for his stance against apartheid. After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission created the path forward which sought to prevent the cycle of revenge between blacks and whites by promising forgiveness to those who confessed to the crimes they committed during apartheid, the daughter of the tortured and now dead activist addressed the commission with tears in her eyes, begging them, absolutely begging them to locate the murderer of her father. But you need to know, she was not crying for want of revenge over what they did to her father. The daughter said she was crying because she did not know who to forgive and consequently could find no peace. The power of forgiveness is that it can bring peace to a tortured soul. If you are lodging, uh, holding, a, a maintaining a grudge that will not go away, then you need to consider forgiving the one for whom your grudge is held because that will ultimately free you from the hold that that person or institution has on you. Can you imagine what it would be like if God held a grudge on you for the things you done or not done to him? What if God held a grudge for your lies? What if God held a grudge for your thievery? What if God held a grudge for your envy? What if God held a grudge for your disrespect? What if God held a grudge for your fornication? What if God held a grudge for your adultery? What if God held a grudge for your idolatry? What if the Lord held a grudge for your sins? You'd be in a whole heap of trouble now, wouldn't you? But scripture says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive those sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I am glad on this morning that the Lord don't hold no grudge against me, but looks beyond my faults to see my very needs. If you are grateful that God's mercy and grace removed his anger and prevents him from having a grudge against you, then you ought to thank him right now. Thank him for the blood of Jesus that washes away your sins and makes you whole again. I don't know about you, but God's got plenty of reason to hold a grudge against me. I've done some things in my life, but God forgave me for my sins, and now he asks me to forgive others just as he has forgiven me. Somebody ought to say thank you right now for not holding a grudge against me, God, for the lies I've told. Somebody ought to say thank you to God right now for not holding a grudge against me for the sins I've committed. Somebody ought to say thank you right now, God, for giving me another day to get right what I got wrong on yesterday. Somebody ought to be real happy about right now that God's mercy and grace has permeated your very life. But now, the question is, are you willing to forgive the one who has trespassed against you just as God has forgiven your trespasses against him and others. Let us pray. Precious God, we come before you imperfect beings. 
We've made mistakes in our lives. We will make mistakes in our lives. But we know that your grace is sufficient. For you loved us enough to give your only son, our Savior, on the cross at Calvary that our sins might be wiped away if we would simply repent. So now, God, we repent of our sins of omission and commission. We pray, God, that you would forgive us yet again, just as you did on yesterday, or just as you did on last week, just as you did on last year or decades ago. We pray, God, you look beyond our faults to see our very needs, and we pray, Holy Spirit, you would move us to be as gracious to those who have sinned against us. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray, amen and amen. Love doesn't hold a grudge. Agape love loves everybody. My prayer for each of you is that you love others just as God loves us despite our own sinfulness. God's not holding a grudge against you. You shouldn't hold a grudge against yourself or against others. If you need to know more about what it takes to become a Christian and a part of this church, please contact the church. The means of contacting us are on the screen. They'll show up a little later. They showed up earlier. All you've got to do is reach out, and we'll reach back to you. We love you. God bless you, and we hope to see you on next week. Amen. After you've gone through the rain.